Support for this podcast comes from AT&T. You know, throughout history, switching to new technology wasn't complicated. Ancient Roman aqueducts made water fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. Electricity made candles fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. Today, we have AT&T 5G. It's fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. Put into a historical context, yeah, it's kind of a no-brainer. AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan may not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. At Qualcomm, we believe in staying connected. And you can see us wherever 5G is helping transform telemedicine, supporting remote education, and powering mobile PCs. The Invention Age is here. Learn more at qualcomm.com slash invention age. Support for this podcast comes from WGU. Do you want a more skilled, loyal, and effective workforce? Consider a partnership with Western Governors University. Over 300 organizations already count on WGU for valuable education benefits. Students can fit schooling around their schedules and even complete courses and degrees sooner than planned. And it's all online. Partner with WGU to make a smart investment in your company's and your employees' future. Learn more at wgu.edu slash partnerships. The question, what do I spray, is the opposite of what I'm describing. And I get that a lot. So it's not reaching for chemicals. It's looking at what methods are available, including chemicals, in an ecologically and economically sound manner. So it involves uh, responsible pest management, economics, and concern for any non-target effects that might uh, come to pass because of the pest management effort. That was Dr. Norman Lepla, the professor of entomology and the founding director of the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences Integrated Pest Management Program. So you're probably on the fence. You either think pesticides are great or you think they're super harmful. Well, if you're a consumer, you are worried that farmers are probably spraying your food with dangerous chemicals that you might ingest whenever you eat them. If you're a farmer, you know that pesticides are expensive and they're usually a last resort to help protect your crop. Today on the show, I wanted to learn more about pesticides from a pesticide expert. So that's who we have on the show today. Um, And this is the Farm Traveler Podcast, and I'm your host, Trevor Williams. And today on the show is Dr. Norman Lepla, someone who knows a great deal about pesticides, how farmers use them, all the research and science about them. So we're going to talk today to Dr. Lepla about the research that goes on behind the scenes, about how they develop pesticides, and how farmers have a process that's called IPM, or Integrated Pest Management. And it's a whole series of steps that farmers and producers can follow to make sure that pests, and really pesticides are really for anything, not just insects, or also for diseases, um, fungi, um, weeds. So pesticides is really a broad term. So he's going to talk to us today about how IPM, or Integrated Pest Management, gives them numerous options, not just using chemicals, but things like biological control, mechanical control, and we'll talk about those. And we're also going to learn what what should consumers know about pesticides and their usage, how are they regulated, and, you know, why don't farmers just use pesticides 24-7? Well, because they're expensive, because... Um, sometimes in large amounts or large quantities, they can hurt the environment. So IPM and numerous steps, thanks to the United States Department of Agriculture, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and a bunch of others, help ensure that these pesticides are regulated and they are not abused in any way, shape, or form. So if you want to learn more about pesticides and how your food is safe, even when pesticides are applied, to ensure you have a safe and healthy food supply, this will be a great episode for you. And in the description, I will link some great stuff for um, Dr. Lepla, his program, and um, the University of Florida's IFAS. Be sure to check it out. This is super cool. It's a deep dive into pesticides and really helping fight, you know, false information out there. Farmers aren't spraying willy-nilly chemicals. And I always love whenever people say, oh, well, farmers are spraying chemicals. On my plants well you know everything is a chemical if it's organic they can use um, spearmint oil which that is a chemical they can spray water which water is a chemical 
So yeah. All right. So I really hope you enjoy this episode with Dr. Lepla. This was a really eye-opening interview. Learned a lot. Um, hope you do too. Thanks for listening. All right. Well, Dr. Norman Lepla, how are you doing? Doing just fine. How are you? I'm doing great. I am super excited to talk with you. It seems like you are basically an expert when it comes to um, integrated pest management, pesticides, and all that good stuff here in Florida. So, And I've got a lot of listeners that are always curious to learn about like pesticides and how they're used. So I feel like you'll be able to answer a lot of those questions. I'll do my best. <laughs> So before we dive into it, kind of tell us about your background. I know you're at the, the University of Florida, the IFA Center Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got there. Well, I am. I'm a professor of entomology in the entomology and nematology department at the University of Florida IFAS. I've been here about 20 years. In my little short history, I started out in 1972 as a new graduate from the University of Arizona and came to Florida as my first job with the USDA Agriculture Research Service here in Gainesville. I was here 16 years and then moved to an opportunity to build a laboratory in Southern Texas at Westlaco for biological control of insects. And I was there a year or so and then moved to Washington DC to the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to uh, manage national programs in pest management. Many people know about things like boll weevil and uh, gypsy moth, those kinds of programs. And I really enjoyed it for another six years. And then I came to uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville uh, with a little stop in Apopka, Florida to help build a uh, new center for ornamental entomology, environmental entomology. And that took about two years. So the whole trip has been in the order of 50 years. There you go. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, I graduated from UF in 2014. And so I don't think I ever had your classes or was near that center. But um, I know a lot of professors at UF that I had or that I've known, like Dr. Folta, Dr. Clark, um, a lot of really good classes. And I mean, might be a little biased here, but I feel like UF has some of the best ag and ag education programs in the country, wouldn't you say? <laughs> well, we're proud of our number one status. We're the largest and considered by some to be number one in the nation for entomology and nematology. Oh, that's awesome. We, Yeah, I had an entomology class in, um, you know, the big entomology lab out there. We would go around for, I think, like a week or so every day after school. We'd go there. You know, we had to do our little bug collection. Mm-hmm. We'd, get, we'd get bugs, butterflies, and all that stuff. And it's so pretty out there. You're, you're in the middle of Gainesville, but because of this little area, you feel like you're in the middle of the woods. And it's so remote. It's really nice. It was always kind of like a good break from classes. Well, it, it's called the Natural Area Teaching Laboratory, and it was established by Dr. Tom Walker that you may have met. Okay. That's pretty cool. And I know that they have like some criminology stuff out there because we were walking around and we we're like, oh my God, what does that smell? Well, it was a boar out there and they were studying <laughs> kind of like how long it takes for maggots and different bugs to appear on a carcass. And so that was, that was really cool. That was a very odd surprise for sure the first time we saw it. Forensic entomology is a very interesting topic. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Are, are, do you know a whole lot about that, too? Well, I know a whole lot about a little thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Jack of all trades, master of none. There That's you go. That's what integrated pest management is all about. <laughs> so, so going off of that, what exactly is integrated pest management? I mean, kind of how is it used, whether that's in farming or around the country and even like people at home that can use it? What exactly is IPM? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a definition out of well more than 100. <laughs> Perfect. Dr. Ron Prokopi wrote one uh, years ago at the Massachusetts, and it's a short, easy one, and it is a decision-based process. It involves decisions about pest management that are coordinated use of multiple tactic, tactics. So that means people use whatever tactics are available, whatever methods are available, making decisions about how to do their pest management. And I will say that the question, what do I spray is the opposite of what I'm describing. And I get that a lot. So it's not reaching for chemicals, it's looking at what methods are available, including chemicals, in an ecologically and economically sound manner. 
So it involves uh, responsible pest management, economics, and concern for any non-target effects that might uh, come to pass because of the pest management effort. Gotcha. So, so really, th- spraying pesticides would be kind of a last resort. Is that kind of correct with this IPM? Well, actually, uh, a lot of people think it's no pesticides or they think it's last resort because that's come into some of the popular uh, literature. But it is not uh, any particular intervention. It's the combination. Pesticides are a part of the arsenal and they're considered within a what we'd like to have is a pest management plan that's well described and implemented when you have a pest problem. Gotcha. Yeah. I studied this a little bit. I took um, a greenhouse management course at UF and they were covering IPM and that really there's a whole bunch of of, um, aspects to it. You've got chemical control, which is things like, um, you know, pesticides, whether they're organic or conventional. And then you've got mechanical control, which uh, it's super simple. I mean, if you have um, a plant that has bugs on it or some kind of disease, you just simply remove it from the area. And then you've got biological control which is probably my favorite because not a lot of people know about it. But like in a greenhouse setting, if you have aphids, you can get their natural predator like a ladybug. And you can buy like 2,000 ladybugs from a store. They're frozen and then you thaw them out in the greenhouse and then they (laughs) eat all the aphids. And so it's such a cool control mechanism that, I mean, doesn't hurt the plants. You're not using any chemicals or anything. So um, what are some great advantages to using mechanical control, biological control, as well as chemical control when you're trying to reduce the amount of um, diseases or pests that might be affecting your crops? Well, the the first thing you do is try to prevent the pest in the first place. And a lot of people forget that step. We have Florida Yards and Neighborhoods uh, as a program that tells people right plant, right place. So the first thing is, if you have a pest problem that just won't go away, you might consider replacing that plant with another plant. But if you're you're a grower, that's in the landscape, but if you're a grower, Uh, and you need to grow a particular crop, maybe you should do crop rotation, or maybe you should get uh, resistant varieties of that crop. There are many things you can do to prevent pests in the first place. Uh, You you mentioned the uh, training that you got in in how to use biological control. Biological biological control has to have a context where it works. You, You can't use chemicals that kill your natural enemies when you're applying natural enemies. That sounds like <laughs> common right, yeah. sense, but people do it. And uh, without getting into a great uh, detail, when you apply the chemicals, there's a certain residual effect. And so you have to know when those chemicals are no longer uh, capable of damaging the natural enemies if you follow per- perhaps with natural enemies. Or if you release simultaneously, you, you might uh, be able to know that the uh, natural enemies are not uh, being harmed by the chemical you're using on the pests. So that's selective pest management. But you mentioned uh, mechanical. Mechanical can work very well um, in, the, in the landscape, in home gardens and so forth. A lot of people use just removing the pest or perhaps using a soap solution that is uh, not phytotoxic to wash them off. So there are many things that can be used to control pests in different situations. That's a very good point. Yeah, I think this is, it's so perfectly designed where you can use pretty much whatever you can. Um, well, I mean, you've got a whole bunch of different op- different options to prevent diseases and stuff like that. When when I, when I taught high school ag in, um, for two years in Daytona, we had a greenhouse and we had a little hydroponic system going on and some aphids were growing. Well, I was like, hey, kids, let's go get some ladybugs. And so we got them. They were thawing out. Well, I made the mistake of leaving the top vent open on the greenhouse. And so we came back. There was supposed to be like a thousand ladybugs. All the students were like, Mr. Williams, where are the ladybugs? I was like, well, there's three here. Mm -hmm. I think the rest of them flew out. So, (laughs) I mean, it works if you pay attention to the environment and make sure, like, especially if you're using biocontrol, that your your beneficial insects aren't going to fly away. (laughs) Well, there, there's an organization called the Association of Natural Biocontrol Producers. And most of the producers of natural enemies and distributors belong to that organization. The organization uh, encourages the use of natural enemies that are laboratory reared. And unfortunately, uh, it sounds like your lady beetles were collected in nature. And 
what they do when they collect them is those insects are hibernating. They, they are generally in an overwintering state and, and they're aggregated. And so when you warm them up, they come out of this diapause, it's called. And the first thing they want to do is disperse. So you saw what happens when, <laughs> when they thaw out and uh, fly away. There are other lady beetles that you can buy uh, from the companies that are uh, designed to stay with your crop, particularly if they're immature insects because they can't fly. And so people need to have a little bit of um, information about what natural enemies to use, and these companies provide that. That makes much more sense. I feel a whole lot better about that then. Um, I did not know that. That's really cool. So let's say you're like a commercial grower. How exactly would a farmer implement um, this integrated pest management to on their operation to where they can control any insects or any diseases that might pop up? Well, the best case is to have an IPM plan so that you identify the risks, whether they be insects, uh, pathogens, weeds, um, or perhaps even uh, uh, things like vertebrate pests, all, all of the things that can uh, cause a crop to be at risk should be considered in developing a plan. And that plan is not done under a lot of stress as it would be if you had a crop in the field and you're losing that crop. You do this when you have time uh, to consider all of the variables that you can control. Another part of this is to get people involved who are experts and perhaps uh, fellow growers who have experience and, and design a way to minimize the cost and the complexity and the difficulty in managing pests. So that means uh, it's knowledge-based and that plan that identifies the risks would also have the options for interventions. And those then would be in a cascade or in tiers. The first would be the, the least risky, things that are uh, perhaps less expensive, uh, certainly effective, but maybe not as uh, likely to have side effects that are unacceptable. So you try those, have those in mind, um, and then if that doesn't work, you might have to use something that's a higher risk, as we say, that is, that has more side effects. Regardless of how that is designed, it is a blend of tactics. That's the important part. It isn't just one thing. The grower needs to look at the, the combination of things that would help them solve a pest problem. That's a very good point. I feel like most consumers, when they think a farmer might incorporate pests or might um, come into contact with pests, that they're just going to spray chemicals 24-7. And the more I learn from farmers on this podcast, like pesticides are super duper expensive. And so those are usually sometimes um, like a very last resort or, but with IPM, they can use those along with mechanical control, biological control and stuff like that. So do you, do you kind of see that as a common misconception that farmers are really just going straight to pesticide use? Well, you, you made a, an excellent point. Uh, certainly the cost pesticides are more and more expensive to use, to apply, uh, to even store. I mean, there are so many regulations that the uh, growers face that they really don't want to go that route if, if they don't have to. The other uh, problem with overusing pesticides or using them without understanding what they do is pesticide resistance in the pests. This is a prevalent problem uh, of overuse of pesticides. So you get a pest that you can't control with the pesticide. And now you've lost that part of the uh, arsenal. And it's a very important part. And you're left with other things that may be less effective on, on their own. So the, the idea of solving a problem just by applying chemicals uh, will backfire. And most, most of the growers these days are enlightened. They know that. And we teach it uh, heavily you need to know the, what's called the group or class of pesticides and rotate between classes so that you're not using the same active ingredients over and over and creating a resistance problem. So irregardless of cost, you're going to lose that capability 
if you keep using it over and over. So going off of that, that's something that I hear a lot from people that are kind of opposed to pesticides, and they always say that you're going to have some sort of resistance. So what exactly happens there? I mean, I'm assuming if you just spray the same crop with the same pesticide over and over again, that um, those pests will eventually become, they like that pesticide won't affect them. So what happens there when um, you have something like, something like that happen? Well, non-entomologists don't have a, an internal concept of how rapidly insects reproduce. You know, it's typical for an insect to produce three, 400 eggs, a female. So you have a reproductive potential there. And the next thing that happens is you kill off a certain part of the population that is susceptible to the pesticides. And that leaves the remaining ones with their high reproductive rate to create the next generation. And you can do this for several generations, and all of a sudden, the only insects growing in your crop are the ones that are resistant to your pesticide. Hmm. Wow. Okay, that's a very good point. Yeah, I didn't know um, what kind of the the reproduction rate that there is on on insects. And so, pesticide is really. Correct me if I'm wrong, but pesticide is really kind of like an overarching term for really any chemical that is going to attack any sort of creature or plant that's going to attack a plant. And so you've got things like insects, you've got um, um, weeds and stuff like that, and also um, um, different diseases. So is that correct? Like pesticides isn't just for insects, it's for a wide range of items that might attack a crop. Well, it's important to be specific. An insecticide is for insects. Uh, Herbicides are for weeds. (laughs) Fungicides are for fungi and so forth. So pesticide covers the whole range of these chemicals. Gotcha. And so kind of going off of that, how do all these pesticides work? I mean, obviously you're going to spray it, the insects or the plants or the fungi are going to come into contact with it. So how does it work on the different species that might come in contact with it? Well, there's a program we we call with the acronym IRAC, the Insect Resistance Management Program. committee and they have classified pesticides or insecticides well pesticides into classes or groups and insecticides into 24 or 23 groups those groups are classified by what's called mode of action that's how they kill the insect so mode of action might be a nerve poison or a muscle uh, poison or something that keeps tissues from doing what they are supposed to do, or a stomach poison that stops the insect from digesting what it eats. Um, There are pesticides or insecticides that desiccate insects, dry them out, because it sucks the water out of their system. So there are all these different ways that our uh, pest management people and our chemists have come up with to try to kill the insects that are a problem uh, for us. And those those ways, those modes of action are ab- about, about 23 in insects and growing. So we keep trying to come up with new ways uh, to manage this problem. I don't, I don't know if uh, most people are aware that insects continually, year after year, destroy at least 20 to 25 percent of our production uh, globally. That's a massive amount of food that we need to recover for our growing population. I did not know that 25%. I mean, I believe it because I think they destroy my garden about 75%. So 25% seems about right. Yeah. (laughs) So we've been covering organic and conventional agriculture in this season a little bit. And one thing that I realized is that normal consumers really think that organic doesn't involve any pesticides. And I mean, People in the industry know that that's not true. And so what are kind of the main differences between organic and conventional pesticides? Like the 3,000 foot view conventional, they can be synthetically made and organic. They are naturally occurring in nature, like a spearmint oil or copper sulfate or something like that. So what are really the main differences between organic and conventional pesticides? Well, the conventional pesticides are labeled by the Environmental Protection Agency and by the state uh, regulatory authorities. So pesticides are legally defined 
and they have labels uh, for use. So that means that anything, it doesn't matter what it is, that a company wants to sell as a pesticide, it, it has to be labeled and it has to be used according to how it is approved. Um, that's a very, very broad range. There have been times in the history of the U.S. that we've had products in the numbers of thousands. Uh, now, a lot of those, most of those aren't available, but they are uh, registered by the company that produces them, and they come and they go. That's, that's a, a, a huge volume of possibilities in non-organic. Organic is a very narrow range of uh, pesticides, and they're approved by what's called, we call it OMRI, O-M-R-I, which is the Organic Materials Review Institute, and they approve anything that's used as a pesticide on an organic crop, and they also approve how the crop is grown. So uh, they, for example, uh, de determine what uh, 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 fertilizers can be used on a crop. And they they uh, approve the land itself that it is is appropriate for organic in in terms of what is in that soil. So with all that said, they also have a set of pesticides that they uh, approve for a crop in a given place and a given pest. And these are often microbial, so they come from uh, what we call naturally occurring uh, microorganisms that are detrimental to insects. And this is a wonderful thing. If you can essentially make an insect sick <laughs> and it dies and you don't harm anything else because those things tend to be host specific, not always, but they tend to be. So you have uh, microbial pesticides, you have some bio pesticides, uh, you have some mechanical things that can be used as a, a coatings perhaps or whatever. Uh, someone wants to use, they have to get it approved by this OMRI organization. Gotcha. And kind of with organic, because those things, I've heard that those are really systemic and the plant won't take those up, for example. And so that's one reason why organic crops are a little bit pricier because they're more, you have to take better care of them and they require more man hours because you're, because if you have to have pesticides, you're going to have to spray a whole lot more. Um, so is that correct in terms of organic pesticides? Well, organic uh, agriculture tends to be more, uh, require more attention. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that synthetic organic uh, insecticides became so popular because that when they're effective, uh, it takes less time to scout for the pests. It takes less uh, concern about lower effectiveness. Some of these, these organic materials are not nearly as effective as the synthetic organic. Uh, but uh, there's there are problems of residue. There are problems of uh, you mentioned systemic. Uh, these products are not systemic, so they're not in the food. Uh, they're on it. They're on the insects. They target um, the pests. They target often a particular stage of the pest. So they take more uh, care in their application and in their evaluation than a uh, than a very highly toxic synthetic chemical. Gotcha. And so how exactly are these regulated? I mean, I can assume that there would be agencies like the EPA or the FDA, USDA, all these government agencies that are just making sure that, those, that these chemicals are regulated. And so how exactly are these chemicals kind of tracked to make sure that they're, they're not abused and they're only used when they're needed? Well, um, that, that is a really good and difficult question. The regulatory agencies do their best, and farmers tend to be responsible um, and good stewards. But you always get get people who um, don't follow um, the law, and we try to try to encourage in every way we can uh, to have people do the the right thing through education. We're not regulators at the university; we use education, and we try to explain to people uh, that. If they're not using these chemicals uh, according to the label, that is what's been approved and studied and determined to be safe if it's used according to 
the regulations. If they're not doing that, everyone suffers, including the grower. Uh, if there are residues, the grower won't be able to sell the crop if they're detected. Uh, there's a certain uh, high probability that use of a chemical that's not approved will be picked up when it's purchased because the uh, source um, is uh, part of the reporting of that, uh, that grower. So where did they buy it and how much did they buy and how did they dispose of what was left? All of that record keeping is reviewed. So there are lots of checks and balances by these regulatory agencies to try to help uh, people uh, be safe and responsible. It can't, it, there, are, there are times, w and we are asked to come in uh, to provide educational support when people just uh, thought they were, they were doing something that would be okay when it really isn't. And, and what, I, what do I mean? One example that's real common is uh, picking up uh, a pesticide in groundwater. Groundwater is sampled, and if it's picked up, it's not too hard to figure out where it's coming from in general. So we might go and, and be asked to talk to a, a grower group that, that grows a certain crop and explain to them that, that by doing that, um, they're breaking the law and they're uh, uh, essentially poisoning the environment and, and they really need to, to not do that anymore. And generally it's, it's remarkable. Um, I've been a little cynical, I guess, like most people are, but it's remarkable how responsive uh, people can be when they realize that that they're really causing a lot of damage. Oh, well, I can imagine. That's good. And I mean, really, anytime I hear somebody think about pesticides like a regular consumer, I feel like that they imagine all pesticides are like DET, where, <laughs> I mean, if they get in the groundwater, they will kill absolutely everything, and ju they'll just kill every plant, every animal they come into contact with. Uh, which, I mean, it's not to say that you don't need to be careful when applying pesticides and, you know, you've got to require your, you've, your PPE, your personal um, protection equipment and stuff like that. But, I mean, they're not as super duper dangerous as the old school DET. Is that correct? <laughs> well, toxicity is a relative thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> yes, we got rid of some of the chemicals that provided acute toxicity to humans. The, the, those were called organophosphates, and uh, and there are just horror stories. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, I got into what I do because I grew up in the Central Valley of Arizona and saw so much damage, and in fact, people dying and uh, getting allergic reactions, and uh, uh, it was a horrible thing seeing dead birds and dead animals in the fields, and it, it, it the acute toxicity had 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 to be eliminated, and it was. Um, but we didn't know uh, as, as a, a population of people, we didn't know what those things would do. And when we found out intervention uh, was applied, you know, that's how we got EPA. The USDA was doing their best. And then, uh, then the government and our regulator or our uh, Congress decided they needed an agency specifically to address this problem. And that's how EPA came into being in about 1972. Uh, now we have a lot of regulations. We have all kinds of reviews. Uh, one of my jobs is to serve as a person who gathers information from growers. Why do you need this chemical anymore? Should we remove it? Uh, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't have a, a, a huge need, uh, why do we have the risk out there? We ask those questions all the time. And one of my jobs is to gather information from growers to explain, to, to know if they really need it and if they're really using it in a way that uh, will help produce our crops. Um, I could go on and on, but uh, basically what happens is um, we, we just have built up over the years as many checks and balances as we can to use more or less risky pesticides. And so these groups I was talking about have evolved from those uh, lower numbered groups, and that would include chlorinated hydrocarbons like DDT, and then the organophosphates and the methylcarbamates. And as you go up the chain, now we're into uh, insecticides that are more targeted. They, they 
affect the pest more than other environmental uh, targets or uh, they're not targets, but they're, they're areas of the environment that become targets. Uh, this is particularly true in things like herbicides. You know, it's, it's hard to keep a, herbicides from affecting a lot of other plants when you apply them. So more targeted application, more targeted um, chemicals is where we've been going over the last 50 years. Gotcha. That's all very good points. I like it. Um, and so kind of going off of that, we'll transition a little bit and kind of talk about you and your work at UF and IFAS. So how exactly are you guys kind of trying to educate farmers as well as consumers on pesticides? Because I'm sure you're trying to do two things. You're trying to showcase and or trying to educate farmers on new developments or new technology, you know, new chemicals and stuff like that, um, new regulations. And then with consumers, you're just trying to show them and educate them you know, on how to apply pesticides at their own home on, on a much smaller scale and also educating them on really what farmers are doing. And so I feel like you guys have your hands full trying to educate people on all this pesticide application stuff. So what do you guys do? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> First of all, who are we? There are 56 of us. There's one in every land grant university in every state and, and commonwealth in the U.S., and it's our job to help educate the uh, extension community. And the extension community is the front line to our uh, citizens, whether they be agricultural, uh, urban, uh, structural pest control, uh, homeowners, it doesn't matter. We cover the waterfront. And we are backed up by four regional centers, and that's backed up by the USDA uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture, and they provide most of our funding through grants. So that's the system uh, that that we use. the The real answer for the homeowner uh, is avoid, avoid and prevent. Uh, first thing you do is become an observer, a scout in your own environment. Watch, look. Uh, be a part of what's going on on your property. If you see something and you need some assistance, that's why we have the extension community and we back them up with our university, what, what are called extension specialists is what I am. So the, the system is there to back up people. Doesn't matter whether they're companies or whether they're individual homeowners or even visitors to our state who are trying to avoid mosquitoes. Whatever it is, we've got the resources and the talent uh, to take care of whoever has a question and whatever the problems might be. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge to connect to people because we're always trying to tell them we're here, uh, but a lot of people don't know that, uh, that they can access us, that we're paid by taxes and we're happy to help. So there's that part, but the main part is the reaction. Most insects aren't damaging. Um, I think of some great big brawny neighbors of mine who are afraid of mosquito are afraid of spiders you know <laughs> there's not much you can do with a guy um that looks like a, a fullback and he's he, he's a, runs from a spider but anyway that sort of thing we we deal with as well we try to tell people you know spiders are your friend <laughs> they're they're predators they're they, they're a sign of a healthy environment because they they're killed by insecticides so your environment must be pretty healthy things like that. And, and if you do see a pest insect, how much damage is it causing? Can you trim your plant a little bit? Can you, can you uh, use some simple, you know, spray it with a hose or shake it off or, you know, just, just try to do things without uh, pesticides in every possible way. Uh, I use my home for an example. We've never had a pesticide inside our home ever. You don't have to. You can exclude pests. You can use screens. You can use, uh, replace your your door thresholds. Uh, you can vacuum up pests. I get calls from people who have pests uh, gotten in the house and oh, they're making a mess. So vacuum them up, and they say, oh, never thought of that. Uh, you can use the fan. People sit on the the lanai the patio and they say, oh my goodness, I'm being eaten alive. I said, well, you thought about putting a fan on these little old insects can't fly upwind. Just common sense, 
But don't turn to pesticides as the answer. Turn to what is the problem and what's a creative solution and what options do I have? Now, let's say I have a relative who's very, very sensitive to mosquito bites. Well, she just isn't going to be able to use what I've just talked about. She's got to stay in the house and use repellents. Well, okay, so we set up a little situation where we can be outside, but she can be inside and we can still interact. Um, you know, on and on, I have just told people so many times, heat, you can use heat, you can use um, insect traps. Uh, we, we get uh, flies in our house. So at night we, we plug in the insect, insect trap. Some people get uh, stored product pests in their uh, pantries. Put a, put a trap in there with a black light. Um, tell you what, there are a lot of ways you can, you can get rid of insects without using pesticides. Yeah, as we've been trying to go like kind of less pesticides in our lawn, um, we had a bad ant problem. And of course, we've got a dog and we only want to do, you know, what's safe for the dog. We don't want our, do our golden noodle getting any chemicals. Well, I learned that you can get boiling water and that will kill off um, ants. I mean, it'll also kill off a little bit of the grass, but I mean, it's such a quick way to get rid of ants and it's worked out pretty great we've got like a, a little electric kettle and we'll use that every now and then anytime we have like a big ant bed pop up so that those are all very good points i mean it's a last resort especially for a consumer to use at home and you can use things like you know vacuuming up like you're saying or using heat and stuff like that there's so many tools that they really wouldn't know about unless you guys are educating them well we do the same thing with ants and it's kind of interesting <laughs> i use soapy water and it okay uh, they really don't like lemon joy, <laughs> but they don't like they don't like other dish detergents either. So I use about two tablespoons in a gallon, and I pour it on them, and it just makes them really mad. And and uh, so if I do that, you know, a couple times a week, they just leave. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't want any part of that anymore. So and I do that with other pests too. You you can harass pests. They uh, um, moles. I, I go around and stomp on their little little holes and uh, and I just keep making them un, unwelcome. And pretty soon the the you know you don't get rid of all of them, but you you can get rid of a lot of them because they just say it's easier to be somewhere else. Um, oh oh yeah, I can imagine. My one of my earliest memories growing up was my dad. We would have a mole cricket problem every now and then, and he would go outside and put down some Dawn dish detergent and then spray it down with water. And it would get yeah. soapy. And within like two or three minutes, you'd have all these mole crickets come up. And we'd be like, oh, here they are. And we just, <laughs> we'd twist our heads off. And it was the weirdest thing. My dog, a big um, bulldog, would just eat them. And we're like, all right, here's a treat. It was weird, but it worked. We never really had a problem after that. Yeah, that that's a good example. And, it, and that does work very well uh, with other pets. The main thing you have to be concerned about with some of these ideas is just test them to make sure you're, you don't have side effects like phytotoxicity, you mentioned the grass dying. Um, so you can create some problems if, if you aren't careful. But I had a good one to share with you. The, the woman called and she had purchased this really expensive side-by-side uh, -side refrigerator freezer and she had uh, mites and she kept having problems and and she'd get rid of them and they'd come back and blah, blah, blah. And so uh, she was gonna give this thing away. And I said, have you considered just having somebody put it, it was July or August. Have you considered just having it out in your driveway for a week? Nothing could survive that. <laughs> sure enough, after a week, the mites were dead. And uh, you just don't think about, people don't think about these uh, simple uh, things. Insects are um, organisms that have to have something to eat. They have to have water and they have to have shelter. And if you take any of those three away, they can't live. One of the things that we do in our house, of course, I don't have little kids and animals running around, but um, we literally uh, make them so thirsty, they die. And silverfish is a good example. We, we have such a dry house, we find once in a while uh, dead insects. We actually find little frogs too, unfortunately, but <laughs> things that get into the house uh, die because they just don't have any water. 
That's so cool. Um, so this is random. Do lizards count as pests at a house? Would you Would you imagine? Uh, well, anything can be a pest if it's in the wrong place, according to to the person who's perceiving the organism. You know, they're generally <laughs> considered predators and and uh, useful. Um, but they're, these things are complicated. The, there are different species, and they have different habitats, and they compete. And so sometimes we have invasive uh, reptiles and amphibians that we think are um, uh, a normal part of our environment, and they turn out to be an invasive that has actually displaced and eliminated uh, the ones that we were appreciating. So uh, uh, this Cuban tree frog is one here in Florida. And I can tell you right now, if one gets into your pool cage and you're trying to sleep at night, uh, he's, he's going in the freezer the next morning. <laughs> they, uh, they are very loud and very aggressive. So, yeah, lizards are generally considered to be uh, benign or, or useful, uh, but it just depends on um, where the pest is. I, I'll give you an example. Earthworms, uh, you know, earthworms are great. You know, you can go fishing. They're good for the soil. They churn things up. Well, there are lots of species of earthworms. Well, I can tell you every once in a while with a heavy rain in Florida, uh, we get a swimming pool full of earthworms and they're not benign. Uh, they're a mess and we have to clean them out. So now they become a pest. So it's a matter of of what the context is. That That's very true. That's a good point. Uh, I, I guess that, like you're saying, anything can be a pest if it's not needed there. Or sometimes if, if it looks like a pest, but it doesn't act like a pest and it's kind of beneficial, then it might not be one. That's awesome. Well, Dr. Lepla, this has been so cool kind of doing a deep dive um, into pesticides and kind of learning more from you about what you guys are doing at IFAS to kind of learn more and to educate farmers as well as consumers. If people have questions on pesticides and their usage, where should they go? Where would you direct them to go kind of go look for more information? Well, first of all, uh, using pesticides is no longer something for amateurs. Uh, there are too many ways that they can be misused and cost money and not effective and all kinds of different problems. So get some, get some professional advice. Uh, our front line is our extension community in every county. We have extension agents and they know a certain amount and they get a lot of uh, repeat calls from people who learn about them because they're really uh, very, very helpful people, very responsive. And if they don't know the answer, they will come uh, to those of us who work in this field every day. And if we don't know the answer, we'll go to the people that, that know more than we do. So that's the, the automatic, no cost uh, support that everybody has in every state and should know about and should use. Uh, I think that most of the um, pest control services are, are moving toward working more with the homeowners if the homeowners want them to, and that's important. So uh, one piece of advice is rather than just look the other way, get involved with your service provider and let them know what you like about their service and what you would prefer to not have with their service. And they have lots of options, and they can uh, they can use those uh, in their marketing uh, to satisfy the customer. This is this is particularly uh, involving what we call thresholds. Um, a lot of times, people have weeds, or they have uh, problems with with grass or or other parts of the landscape that aren't really it isn't really necessary uh, to to do anything. And they can say so. They can say, you know, that problem isn't bad enough that I really want you to, to use an insecticide or, or uh, remove the tree or whatever. It's okay. Uh, we actually, of course, we're, we're in this kind of mindset, but we actually ask our neighborhood to leave some dead trees up because the woodpeckers need them. And they, and they respond, oh, well, the neighbor's one of those dead trees gone, but if they know the woodpeckers need them, that's different. And so you go to your neighborhood association and, and you 
explain some of these things and people go, oh, wow. So now you got a bunch of people watching birds instead of cutting down trees. You know, it, it, right back to education. It's just my advice is start looking at the environment as a wonderful living thing and do everything you can to avoid uh, 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 pest management that could disrupt that system you live in. I like that education, 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 and and I, yeah, I think a lot of people aren't they don't realize that there are so many more tools than just directly spraying chemicals. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, you've got mechanical control, biological control, so much stuff available, and I think you guys are doing a great job educating farmers as well as consumers on what to do. Um, this has been super cool. I know I'll probably go back and listen to this a couple of times whenever I start over my garden or I just have any more questions on this. Um, Dr. Lepla, I really appreciate it, man. This was awesome. Um, keep up the good work, and you guys have done a great job so far at IFAS, um, and we'll be in touch. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share these things. Um, a lot of people can benefit by thinking about ways to manage pests without any risk to themselves or the environment. I like that, yeah. Yeah, it's a win-win. That's awesome. All right, well, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.